hand cut dovetails. That phrase in and of itself kind of has a mystique to it. It immediately speaks artisan craftsmanship. Well, there's a lot of videos on how to cut dovetails and there's a lot of masters out there showing you how to cut dovetails using a minimal amount of tools. This is not gonna be one of those videos. If you've cut some dovetails before, don't watch this video. Go watch you know, videos of soldiers returning home to their dogs. Or go watch Matt Carmona saw up some logs. People seem to like to, like to watch that no matter how much experience they have. This is about cutting your first dovetail. More importantly, it's about ripping off the band-aid of the mystique of dovetails, not obsessing over the tools, grabbing what you have, and just start cutting a dovetail. So you want to cut hand cut dovetails. You are not alone. I think this is probably the number one entry point to people with hand tools. You may have been woodworking for decades using power tools and the first time you pick up a saw is probably to cut dovetails. It's the one area where machine jigs, router jigs tend to kind of fall down when we want to make those skinny little dovetail pins like I have on this piece, or the ability to create a, a truly handcrafted drawer or something like that, that dovetail saw and a chisel really comes into play. But at the same time, I think it's the number one stumbling block for people getting into hand tools because so much has been written about dovetails. And for that matter, there's so many tools and gizmos and gadgets specialized around hand cutting dovetails that it becomes even more confusing. I know I fell into this trap myself when I cut my very first hand cut dovetail. And I remember pouring over videos, well, YouTube didn't exist then, <laughs> but I remember pouring over well, podcasts um, and, and looking at books and reading magazines, trying to figure out the best way that was gonna be for me to cut a dovetail. And I never even picked up a saw. I also remember acquiring tools, thinking I need to have these four tools before I can cut a dovetail. And that I think is where a lot of folks go wrong. Now, if you search, you'll find videos of some masters of woodworking out there cutting dovetails with a sharpened screwdriver and cutting dovetails with a coping saw or cutting dovetails with, you know, a big old hand saw. That is all possible. But most of us, this is just unrealistic. I mean, why would I cut a dovetail using this saw? I could show you how to cut a dovetail with this saw and it, it's just silly. It's not worth the time and the effort. Some back saws and chisels are gonna be needed. But rather than amassing a bunch of tools or a couple of tools or expensive tools just to cut your first dovetail, let's rip the Band-Aid off, people. Let's cut your first dovetail and use something that can at least get you started. You're gonna learn more about how to hand cut dovetails on your second, third, and fourth attempt than you will on that first attempt. And I don't care how many fancy tools you have, you're not gonna learn as much. So it's best to Get some cheap tools, use what you have already in your shop to cut that verse dovetail, understand the process, and then realize it's actually not that difficult. Honestly, there are a lot more difficult joints than the dovetail, but this pedestal that it sits on in the minds of so many woodworkers has us thinking it's super difficult and it requires specialized tools. Today, we're gonna use a couple of chisels. And if you have a set of chisels already that can be really nice. If you don't have any chisels at all, then you need at least one, maybe two. And I would recommend a 3 8 or a quarter inch chisel. If you really want to splurge, throw on a half inch chisel there as well. The additional chisels you'll have will give you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to actually laying out your joints. And then you're going to need a back saw. So I went to Home Depot just this morning and I bought a saw shaped object. Um, I don't know what else to call it. I mean, it's not terrible, but I literally spent, here's my receipt. It was $9.97 for this Husky, what they call a 14 inch miter back saw. It's got a handle. I think that's a handle. The angle of it is kind of odd, but you know what? It is a back saw. And the important part about this is it is sharp. I mean, could it be sharper? Maybe. Could the teeth be of a better geometry? Probably. If you've never sharpened a saw or tuned a saw, that's a whole other skill. 
What we want is right out of the box, you spent $10, hopefully you have some chisels. If you don't have some chisels, you probably should get some anyway, but there's no reason to spend a bunch on chisels either. I could have picked some up at Home Depot while I was getting this saw. The first, some orientation. Here is a completed dovetail joint. This is the tailboard. This walnut here is the pin board. These guys right here, we may think of them as like the male part of the joint. Those are the tails. And then the female part of the joint, these are the pins. These little guys sticking up are the pins. You'll hear a lot of talk about, do you cut them tails first or pins first? What I'm gonna show you today is how to cut them tails first, but I highly recommend you try it both ways. The reason I recommend cutting tails first is this angle of the tail. This throws a lot of people off. Well, when you cut the tail angle, it doesn't matter. When you start with the tail, it doesn't matter what this angle is or where it's positioned, but we take the shape of this board and we trace it onto our pin board and we cut out from there. Now on the pin board, the angle is across the end grain and I find a lot of people have more success trying to saw trying to saw at an angle across the end grain rather than trying to saw at an angle along the face. The body mechanics and the geometry when you hold your body is a little bit more awkward trying to saw the angle here than it is lining up and working across the end grains. But you know, I also said that you're gonna learn a lot in cutting your second, third, and fourth dovetail joint. So I actually recommend, after you've cut a couple of tails first, switch over to pins first. Try it from there and you might hate it or you might love it. You might discover that my dovetails are much better when I cut them pins first. In the end, you're gonna to wanna to learn to do both ways because there's gonna be a time when the joint, however it's situated in the piece, won't allow you to cut it tails first or won't allow you to cut it pins first and you're gonna to have to be able to switch and go the other direction. Okay, you're gonna need some wood, obviously. <laughs> you're gonna need two pieces and you do wanna make sure that the ends that you're gonna be joining together are square both across the width and across the thickness. That's the first part, stock preparation. Next comes labeling it. And I'm gonna put these two corners together. And what I will always do is label my parts using a triangle system. More often than not, when you're dovetailing, you're, door you're putting together a box, like a drawer box. So if this were the drawer front, I would put the top of the triangle on the drawer front, and I would put the side of the triangle on the side here. So when I take them all apart, I can mix them around, shuffle them up all over, and I put them back together. First of all, the mark is always on the top, so that always tells me what face is up, and I can essentially just reassemble the triangle to have my box come back together. It's a key thing, making sure you're keeping track of your tailboard and your pin board and how they go together. Because when you're hand cutting your joints, every single cut you make is going to be unique. And you can't expect the left side of a drawer to fit into the right side or the back or flipped end to end or anything like that. Every single joint you make is unique and it has to be marked as such so that it all goes back together. The next thing is you need to mark out the baselines here, the depth of the cut that you're making. And you really need to use a knife for that. A pencil line, it helps, but that knife line is so important because it allows a chisel to drop into the knife line. Now, right away, you'll find all kinds of marking gauges and things like that. This is a Veritas wheel gauge, and it's particularly beneficial when cutting dovetails because we know we've already squared up the ingrain. The ingrain can be a reference surface. So I can take my gauge and I can set it to the thickness of the board that I'm joining it to. Now, in this case, both of these boards are the same thickness. Actually, they're both the same board. They're cut out of the same piece. I can set that so that it matches the thickness and I can very easily run off the end and lay in a baseline. This is why these wheel gauges are effective. Very quick and easy to do that. Very repeatable to do it on both boards. Well, maybe you don't have one of these. Maybe you don't have a marking gauge. Well, you probably can find an X-Acto knife or a pocket knife or something. Here's a fancy actual marking knife, but in this case, it's a knife. That's the important part. And what you would wanna do is um, you would wanna be able to set the distance of the board. So in this case, I would take the board I'm joining, set it on top, flush it up with the edge, and then I'll take my knife, and I'm opposite of the camera here, but I'm just gonna 
drop it right in there so that it is marking that thickness. Then grab a square. I can, the other nice thing about a knife point is it's very easy when you pull the knife out to be able to find that point again and drop it back in. Now with the square up against the edge, I can run a knife line around the board and I've got that baseline set. As you can see, it's a little bit more cumbersome than using something like this marking gauge. So it's really easy to just run that across. Now the good news is, is with this gauge, the same setting that I used over here, you see when I run this across the board, the knife line that I made using the square and the knife is the exact same place. I didn't create a new knife line. So I can verify that that was important. I do think, however, whatever you do, do the same technique on both boards. You know, I use the square and the knife on one board and use the gauge on the other board. That is, that's, that's going to lend yourself to, to mistakes. So even though I'm showing demonstration, I am going to come back and just double check with my marking gauge. And I'll go ahead and put it on the ends as well. Just consistency in marking will go a really, really long way there. Next, I need to determine what's my tailboard, what's my pinboard. I already did that. If this were a drawer and this were the drawer front, I would want the tail to go into the drawer front because the, the force, the wedging action, prevents the board from coming apart, prevents the front from coming off, and that's the drawer front is being pulled out. So this is going to be my tailboard. And if you want, go ahead and write tail on it. And just for fun, even though obviously if this one's tail, this one must be pin. But if you had four parts, you would want to mark tail and pin. So now we've got them marked. Now the next thing you're going to see is a lot of fancy dovetail layout jigs. Here is a one in four dovetail marker from Sterling Toolworks. Um, I've got one here from Veritas that is one in eight. Or here's just a wooden one that was made in the shop. Those are nice. Those will certainly help speed up layout. You also could just use a plain old bevel gauge to do this. For your first dovetail, don't worry about it. And here's again why I like cutting the tails first. What I'm going to do is eyeball the center of the board and I make a little mark there. Then I'm going to eyeball the center there. I make a mark and eyeball the center there. I now divided the board into quarters. And here's another key. When you're first, when you're practicing dovetails, you hear a lot of people saying, make a two dovetail joint. I disagree. I actually think you should make a three and four dovetail joint because you'll find the, the, the more tails in the joint, the more difficult it is to fit together. And you can get really, really good at cutting two dovetail joints, two tail dovetail joints, and then switch over to four and five and completely botch it. And more often than not, in furniture we're making, it's using more than two tails. So step it up just a little bit. Don't, you know, give in to the, the easy thing here and make a two or excuse me, make a three or four tail joint. Now, the next thing to consider is, again, if you have a whole set of chisels in various sizes, you can afford to be more cavalier about this whole thing and laying it out. But if you have one chisel, the important part is to make sure that your chisel is going to be able to fit in between your tails. It's always going to fit between your pins because your pins ideally will be bigger than your tails. But if you lay out, you know, a bunch of angles that are super, super tight on here, and the chisel doesn't fit between them, you're not, there's nothing you can do there. You're screwed. So again, that's why I recommend uh, a quarter inch chisel, a nice half inch or three eighths inch chisel will be really beneficial. It's a good all around size for typical furniture size parts. I think I'll probably end up using the quarter inch for most of this. But as you're laying these things out, just be aware that if you've got a really skinny space, grab your tool and make sure that it'll work. And in fact, what we can do, I'm going to use this half inch chisel and uh, I am just going to set it in my baseline kind of right under the center mark. This is the center of the board here and I'm going to trace its shape. Now I'm going to come over and center it over this quarter line. Trace the shape there. And then finally, right there. And this is going to give me one, yeah, it is gonna give me four dovetails. So let's come up here to the top and where'd my, I'm gonna 
grab a smaller square. While I can certainly use my larger square here, it kind of gets in the way of the camera. So I'm going to come up to that little center line I did before and step off of it, I don't know, some distance, an eighth of an inch, and square a line across. Now I'm going to come to the other side of the line and step off another eighth of an inch and square a line across and repeat that at each one of these points. And the last thing, right at the edge of the board, I'm going to come in like an eighth of an inch. And you keep, you notice I keep saying like an eighth of an inch, like a sixteenth. The distance here really doesn't make that much difference. Now, you really just need to connect the points down here. So that point on my chisel that I traced to there, there's a tail angle. There's a tail angle. Here, I don't have a mark at the bottom, so I'm just going to kind of eyeball it and make it look about the same. This is definitely the slower way to do this, guys. If you have a bevel gauge, it's just so much easier. Or if you have one of those dovetail marking tools, you can get much more repeatable results here. But these angles are not going to be all the same. They're going to be close, but you know, I can already see this angle is not as steep as that angle. You look at a lot of antique furniture and you'll find the same thing. The angles all over the place. And normally I wouldn't even go through this phase. I would just grab my saw and start cutting. But when you're cutting your first dovetail, I think it's important to have some lines to work to. The really important thing though, is to make sure I'm marking the parts that I want to cut out. So, on the end grain and on the face grain. There's really no reason to mark it over the other side, but if you really want to, you could transfer all your lines over. But once you start doing that, having some more specialized marking tools becomes a lot easier. But this is it. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop a pencil in my baseline just to darken it in and make sure we can see it. That's the joint laid out, the first part of the joint, the tail part. There's no reason to really have a bunch of fancy tools. The fancy tools are going to make it um, the joint come together any better. They're just going to speed up this process and add a little bit of consistent look to the whole thing. Now is when everybody starts getting real excited. It's time to cut start cutting dovetails. Calm down. Pull that tailboard out of the vise. Grab a piece of scrap wood that's already in your shop. Put that in your vise. And again, we're assuming this is going to be the first dovetail joint you cut. And since so many people get their experience with dovetails, it's the first time using a handsaw, well, it might make a good idea to kind of warm things up a little bit. Now, you saw me take this out of the Home Depot bag. I have never made a cut with a saw. So there's another reason to kind of get familiar with it. So let's warm up. I'm not gonna go out and run a 5K or run a 10K or, or you know, ride my bike 100 miles without spending a little bit of time warming up, loosening up the, the, the joints, the muscles, etc. Well, same thing applies here. And getting to know your saw and understanding how it works is gonna go a really, really long way to your success. Another thing that helps is wax, especially on a saw that you may not know how well that saw is set you know, how widely the teeth are spaced apart. Who knows how it's gonna work. So a little bit of wax will help. Don't worry so much about being straight across or anything like that. You wanna focus on just getting the saw started. A lot of people really struggle getting it started and you see you're doing this, kind of making backstrokes like this. That's just gonna deform the work and it's actually gonna prematurely dull the saw. You should aim to be able to start your saw, not with a bunch of pull strokes, but with a nice smooth push stroke. And here again is why I'm saying don't try to do this with a 26 inch handsaw. You can do it, but the coarser teeth on there is gonna make things a lot harder. Stack the cards in your favor, spend the $10, you know, on this saw. So what I want you to do is set the saw on here. I grab, again, I'm left-handed, so if, you, if it really makes you feel better, I can switch to my right hand, but it's the same thing. I'm gonna take my non-sawing hand and just kind of pinch the wood a little bit. What that does is allow me to press the saw plate up against it, and it's like training wheels or an outrigger in a canoe. It gives you a little bit of steady rest, and you're kind of pushing the saw plate against the fingertips. And this allows you to focus on your grip back here, 
and essentially pull the weight up. I'm kind of tweaking my wrist and lifting the weight off the toe of the saw. And by doing that, it allows the saw to glide over the work and start on the push stroke. Now, the further or closer I am to the tip, the more that weight is kind of cantilevered out and the more it weight kind of freezes on you, doesn't want to start. So if you're struggling, you can start halfway down the saw and you'll find that it's a little bit easier because you don't have quite so much weight cantilevered out there. Ideally, you do want to try to use as much of the saw as possible. So focus on just starting the saw and that's it, just one stroke. But the idea is to get a nice smooth start. We don't want to have it kind of struggle and then suddenly let go. It should just easily start. And you may not be putting any depth in there at all. This is the key part I think in dovetailing is getting that nice smooth start. If you're struggling to get it to start, there's every chance that it will pop off your line and you won't be able to, you won't start out the cut well. If you're starting smoothly and easily, it's real easy to follow your line. So just spend some time couple minutes, make 10, 12, 30, 40 cuts, just kind of warming up that starting stroke. Because really, once it's started, it's easier from there. It's real easy to continue doing, it's just push back and forth. Once the cut is started, the saw will cut quite easily. It's that first saw stroke that's really gonna make or break your cut. So I've got the, the tailboard now on my vise, and it is important that it's held securely. You don't obviously want this shifting around on you while you're sawing. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I need to saw across the end grain. That is the most important cut here. This needs to be a square cut. As I said before, this angle doesn't matter. But if this isn't square and it curves in and curves out, it can create a wedge that will cause your, it just won't fit or it will split apart your pin board when you try to drive it together. So all I'm focusing on on this cut is this line across the top. I do not care about that angle. We've drawn in these pencil lines to give us something to follow to, but if you miss those lines, it's not the end of the world. If you miss the lines on the top, your joint is not gonna go together well. So here again, I pinch the wood, I push the saw plate up against it, and in this case, I'm just gonna start right on that line. So I set the saw so that it's actually lined up on my pencil line. I can not I can see the saw is pretty much splitting that pencil line all the way through. I'm gonna lift the saw plate up so that I'm parallel to the top, and I'm just going to make one stroke across. Now here again, that easy, smooth start makes it so much easier to see, to, to track my line. I am dead on my line right there and I'm nice and square across. Now with that established, I can drop the handle down. And by dropping the handle down, it allows me to now put my focus on the line on the front, the angle. Having already cut this line, I pretty much have kind of a guide to keep the saw cut square. So now, I will saw down the face until I hit my baseline. Once I hit there, I essentially have a, a saw curve from the back here to the front there. I need to connect those so it's, I can lift the saw plate up, bringing the saw down parallel here so that I hit my baseline on the front and back of the cut at the same time. So really, it's a three-step process. You'll see a lot of people who, I, I saw the left-hand angle here, a lot of people will do all the left-hand angles and they do all the right-hand angles across. There is some merit to that because you kind of get used to setting your body at that angle, whereas going the left angle then the right angle, it's a little bit of a jarring action. I'm probably overthinking that, but let's just do all the left-hand side first. Think of it as a three-step process. Nail that line across the end grain, nice and square. Then drop the handle down, focus on your line on the front, now raise the handle again, and complete the cut. And lather, rinse, and repeat. Now I'll do all the right hand sides. <laughs> 
As you get better at this, what you'll start doing is lining up across the end grain and actually angling your saw and trying to mirror, instead of going straight down, which you can do, but you try to mirror that angle. So what I'm doing now is looking straight down my saw plate. I've got my saw right here on the line across the end grain, nice and square. And as I sight down it, I can match the angle of the tail. But I'm still breaking it into two different cuts. I've got that cut that starts across the end grain and then the drop of the handle down the face. So if you have a coping saw, this can be a time where you can come in and saw out the waste in between. I'm going to show you how to do it with a chisel rather than assuming you have a coping saw. Plus, I think there's some skill building in there. But I do want to saw out the edges first, what we call these half pins on the end. And I can use the same saw for that. I've got a knife line that runs across here. And if you really want, you can grab a chisel. Excuse me while I step in front of the camera. And you can work the chisel into that knife line and it gives you a little bit of a wall that you can put your saw against. But it's the same technique of getting a nice, smooth, easy start on the push stroke. And you'll find that sometimes you don't really need that little knife wall to work against. It's just a matter of starting the saw cleanly and easily right on your line. Saw makes quite a bit of vibration on the back stroke. It's interesting to me. It tells me the uh, rake angle could use some improving, but that's a whole other topic for a different time. So let's set the saw aside for now. And here again, you remember I laid out my spacing of the tails by using my chisel. So I could actually drop my chisel right in here and I can very easily chop all the way down. And because the chisel exactly fits there, it's a lot less error. However, I recommend you don't do that first. I recommend you actually start away from your line. And if you have a narrower chisel, now's the time to use it. And here's why. If I put my chisel right in my baseline, and again, because I used a knife, the chisel kind of clicks and drops in there. If I start hammering on the chisel with a mallet, the wedging accent of the chisel is going to drive this chisel back beyond my baseline, and I'll end up with gaps there. So really what you need to do is build up a bit of resistance there, build a little wall there. And here again is an opportunity where you can use your chisel and kind of chisel out a little bit of a little divot there to give you somewhat of a wall for the chisel to work against. What I prefer to do is actually step away from my baseline. I'm, you know, an eighth of an inch or more away from the line. And I'm going to chop from there. Now what that's done is sever those ingrain fibers so I can now come back with the chisel and chopping back at an angle, I can very easily pull out some waste. Now, what I've got is that little chiseled out area gives me a, a release valve. It allows me to bring my wider chisel in, and now when I chop down, there's plenty of room for the waist to wedge into. The wedging action of the chisel is not pushing against a bunch of solid material. It's pushing into dead space. So I don't, it doesn't drive the chisel back. Now I'm not on my baseline here. I'm a little bit away from it, but I can chop straight down. Now I can come back to my baseline. I've got maybe a 16th of an inch material of waste material left. I can drop the chisel, let it click into that knife line, and I angle it forward just a little bit. And that gives me a little bit of an undercut. But here again, because I laid out my tails 
using my chisel, that's all I got to do. I've perfectly lined up in between there and I can continue to chop material out the rest of the way. So I've chopped a little bit from the first side. I'm going to flip the board over. I'm probably about halfway through. Now I'll come back to the opposite side, stepping away from my baseline. And you can see right there, it even started to break out because I'd already chopped through. So now I've got that relief valve. I can come back with my wider chisel, chop my way down. Now drop it right in my baseline. And you may find that there's sometimes can be a little bit of schmutz in the corner that just needs to be cleared out. But for the most part, you're done. You've, get a, you've got a slight undercut through the middle there. So if I were to run a chisel through from end to edge, <coughs> edge to edge, I can see it's touching the baseline in the back, touching the baseline in the front. And if I kind of peer in there, there's a little bit of light underneath the chisel. I've got a slight undercut. And that's really beneficial for fitting your joint. Basically, I want to repeat the same process on these other two. Starting a little ways away from the baseline, chopping out the material to give me a, a release area for the wood to squeeze into. And then going to my wider chisel and work from there. This board's done. There's nothing else to do. Don't try to mess with anything. I can see some pencil lines where I didn't get my angle exactly right. Again, none of that matters because this shape is going to get transferred onto my pin board. So let's do that now. So what I have to do I check my marks, make sure that I've got the, you know, the right side up and everything, and I will position it in my front vise. I always use my block plane for this. Um, no reason why I'm using the block plane. It's just the tool that I've been grabbing for for years. And I set my pin board to the same height as that block plane. And what that allows me to do is then pull my block plane back and it gives me uh, <laughs> a support that I can now line my tailboard on top of my pin board. I'll take my chisel and press the chisel alongside of the pin board. And then I can press the tailboard up against that. And what that's ensuring is that these are square. This chisel is flat on the back and by pressing it against the plane of the side of the pin board and pressing the tailboard flush up against that, I've ensured that this geometric plane on the side is now the same. And I want to slide the tailboard forward and back until I can clearly see everything is lined up. And what you should be feeling on the end here is everything should be flush. There are some people who tell you to lay it out a little proud and true it up later. I just find that it's easier to lay everything out flush. Now I can press down and I'm holding everything firmly in place. The block planes are providing the support in the back. So everything's nice and level. And now you grab your X-Acto knife and use a knife or just use a pencil. Now a mechanical pencil is going to serve you a lot better here because you're going to get, you know, a much finer line. A lot of people will tell you, you've got to have a knife for this. I've actually discovered in recent years that I almost prefer working off the pencil line. That is entirely up to you. The important part is that you can get everything marked cleanly without moving the tailboard at all. You don't want to have to come back and do this again. So now, I've got everything marked. Before I just take the tailboard and pitch it to the side, I slide it back. And here, it allows me to clearly see where I'm gonna saw and where I don't wanna saw. Obviously, wherever there's a tail, 
is an area I need to saw. So while I'm sitting right here, clearly able to see where the pins are and where the tails are, I'm going to mark X's in the waist. There's no confusing it while the board is right next to it. Now I can pull that board away and I can still very clearly see that I, here is my pen. I've got to saw this area out and this area out and this area out because this is where people get in trouble. You get all these lines and you forget what side of the line you're supposed to be sawing on. Now here is a great opportunity to grab a square and now take your lines and run them down the face of the board. As you do more and more of this, you'll find that you may not need these additional lines. When you're first learning, I highly recommend you use these lines because the lines can be really beneficial when it comes to actually fitting the joint later. If the idea is to remove my pencil lines and the joint is not fitting and I can still see some graphite on the board, that tells me there's an area that needs to be removed. So, Pencil is really key here. A knife line could be done as well, but a knife line may not be as visible as a pencil line. And now that I've got these pencil lines down the face, I'm gonna come back and put an X on the face showing where I'm supposed to remove the waste. It's so important to mark your waste here because now we have to saw on one side of the line or the other. Ultimately, what I need to do here is saw in the waist and leave my pencil line. You could split your pencil line, but because I'm, I'm using a radiata pine here, it's a little bit softer, it's gonna compress a little bit more, leave my pencil line entirely, and it will give me a little bit tighter fit and compress into it. In a harder wood, you're probably gonna, the idea is gonna be to actually split that pencil line. Even then, I think if you leave the pencil line, you're okay. So. The, core, the important part is, is making sure you're sawing on the appropriate side of that line. So now I grab my saw. And what's important now? Well, I definitely want to saw down these lines on the face. Because if, if I'm off square on these lines and it gets narrow at the bottom, well then it's never going to fit together and it's going to act like a wedge as I drive this tailboard down. It's going to split the board apart. The angle is also important. That is what, if I miss this angle on the, on the end grain, that's gonna, what's gonna cause unsightly gaps as the joint comes together, and that's what people don't like is gaps. So unlike the tailboard, where we're, all we have to do is focus on the end grain line, now we gotta pay attention to both lines. But the good news is, I'm sawing straight up and down. No matter what I do, I'm sawing vertically. And if you let it, gravity will be really helpful here. So I want to still break this into multiple parts. I'm going to pinch the wood. I'm gonna set my saw right on the angled line so that I can clearly see the pencil line on the keep side of the saw. I'm sawing in the middle here, in the waist. And the good news when you pinch your fingers, this is a Rob Cosman trick. When you pinch your fingers here, as you squeeze them, you actually can move the saw. So watch my saw closely here. As I squeeze my fingers together, see the saw moving laterally? That's just me doing this on the other side. As I squeeze together, your fingers kind of smoosh out a little bit. And if the saw plate is pushed up against it, you can position it little micro movements left or right. So as I'm looking at my pencil line and I line the saw up on it and I see I'm not quite on my pencil line, I can squeeze my fingers and move it into place. So now, taking the weight off the saw, and remember a nice, smooth, starting stroke. I've got that angle now perfectly nailed. So now what I wanna do is, just like with the tails, I wanna drop the handle and focus on hitting the line that we just drew down the face. Now we've done that, so I raise the handle up again and I work to the baseline on the front and the back. And just repeat that all the way along the board 
this is not a race. There's no reason to try to rush through these cuts. And if you find maybe the saw is binding on you or something like that, you're probably trying to push it too hard. You're just trying to go too fast. Take it easy, relax your grip, take a breath. What do they say with, with marksmanship, with shooting? You should always release your breath and then squeeze the trigger, not pull the trigger. Well, you release your breath and just push the saw lightly forward. So just for fun, I mentioned a coping saw or fret saw earlier. This is what I do when I'm sawing now. I have a saw that I can come in and work right along my baseline at a right angle to my first saw cuts. And you can see that dramatically speeds up the process. And if you're really good with a saw, you can essentially split your baseline, which I did here. This is done. There's no chiseling needed here. But, you know, this is another saw. It's another tool. Let's go back to the chisels. And the exact same technique we used for chopping out the waste in between the tails is now done on the pin board. As before, step away from my baseline and chop down. Now here, again, I'm about probably an eighth of an inch away from my baseline. Now I've got big chunky tails here. Since I've severed that, it's real easy to just come into the end grain and just chop and it will split its way back and give yourself a nice step that is real easy to now come back and chop down and not worrying about that chisel being driven back past my baseline. So now I'm gonna drop it right in my baseline. Now here, Unfortunately, I don't have, you know, the luxury of the chisel perfectly matching the baseline. So it's especially important that I've got that knife line there. So now I can just continually drop the chisel and it clicks into that knife line. So you get consistency, repeatability along the entire length of the baseline. Being able to do it in a single chop does make things you know, a lot easier, a lot faster, but it's the knife line and the consistency of the knife line that makes it possible. Put it over and repeat the process. And we're through on that one. There we go, all chopped out and ideally everything should fit together. I think the real key with dovetails is that they should fit together right off the saw. You shouldn't have to do any more work to this. And that I think is where a lot of people go wrong is they've got the pin board now chopped out and they continue to fiddle with it with chisels. A good dovetail joint is gonna fit together right off the saw and the more you have to mess with it, the greater your chances are that you're gonna screw the whole thing up. So what you should be aiming for in your first dovetail joint is something that will tap together and it might be loose. It might have some gaps. Or it might go together beautifully. 
The important part is any gaps you have, it doesn't really matter because having been through the process now, you understand the process of cutting the tails and how the angle of the tails isn't as important because you're transferring that onto the pins. You can look at those gaps and, and begin to understand how, what did I do to create those gaps? So the gaps on the baseline, it was probably how I was chopping things out. Are the gaps along the top, along the angle? Well, maybe I wasn't sawing right to my angle and you could look and see where there's still a bit of pencil line that's missing. The key is you've ripped off the band-aid. You've cut a dovetail joint now. You now know what the process entails to do it and that there's not a lot of mystery in the tools itself. It's a saw and it's a chisel. And the more joints you cut, the second joint you cut, I guarantee your angles are gonna be a little bit better. Your gap's gonna be a little bit better. Third joint, even better, even better, even better. And there's no doubt that with every dovetail you cut, you're gonna figure out little tips and little tricks that work for you. Not what somebody else told you to do to cut good dovetails. The learning how to cut dovetails comes from cutting dovetails. So just cut the first one. I don't care if you don't have any tools. If you don't have any tools at all, $10 at Home Depot gets you the saw. Maybe another $10 will get you a couple of chisels. The key is just do it, just cut one. And the things that you learn from that very first joint will be amazing. And the second one will be that much better. And yes, there will come a point where you decide, I want a fancy dovetail saw. And that will create better dovetails. I think the thing with the, the more fancy, the more specialized tools is they make you more efficient. They allow you to do what I just did faster with greater accuracy. Is this saw any better than the saw that I just used if I tuned it properly? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, yes, this saw will be a little bit better. Is it gonna allow you to cut better dovetails? Probably not. What this saw will do will allow you to cut better dovetails probably sooner than if you kept working with this saw. But please don't think I've got to amass a bunch of tools and amass a bunch of things and do a bunch of prerequisites before I can cut my first dovetail. If you wanna to learn to cut hand cut dovetails, go figure cut hand cut dovetails. And if the barrier is I don't have tools, well, $10 shouldn't be a barrier for anybody. So folks, go cut some dovetails and have fun with it.